Well, good morning. Uh, last night, uh, I, I obviously introduced a little bit of my, my theme and my topic and where we're going to go, uh, just to give you a little, a little uh, understanding of who it is that's standing here and speaking to you. I know, I know a lot of you, but there's a lot of you I don't know yet. Uh, but I grew up about 45 minutes from here in the great state of South Jersey. Yes. Man, we need to recruit more in South Jersey, Graham. Uh, and I reluctantly came to Chehi uh, a long time ago. I'll, in fact, I'll just come clean and be honest. It was 29 years ago uh, that I came and sat where you were sitting for the first time. And my sister had been here for three seasons before that. But I, I really wasn't interested in coming to Chehi. Uh, and my sister finally convinced me. And if you want to know what it took to convince me, you can ask me. I'd love to tell you. But when I got here, and I arrived here, I had no idea what God was going to do in my life. But God was about to reveal himself to me in a way that I needed to see him. And God was about to awaken me to a reality that I needed to go deeper in my walk with him and to actually live out my identity as a follower of Christ. I struggled with that. I, I knew I was saved. I loved going to church. Right? I, I, Sundays were like my favorite day. But I didn't live out my faith. I didn't follow Jesus in everyday life. I was afraid to. I didn't know how to do it. I, I, I struggled with wanting to fit in. All those things that, that are common to us. But it was while I was here that God really gripped my heart, not only with who he was, but who I was. And I saw other students, my peers, I saw them taking their faith seriously and wanting to follow Jesus. And I realized that's, that's who I am. That's what I want. And God really began to do a great work in my life. It was also while I was here that, that I felt called uh, to, that God was calling me to serve him in ministry. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what that looked like. And to be honest, in, in, a, in a real real way, I ran from that call for about three years. Right? I, I did the Jonah thing. But thankfully, God used other means besides a fish right, to get my attention. So I now uh, serve as a pastor in Virginia. So when I'm not here, that's what I do the rest of the year. Uh, and my wife, Laura, is here. We've been married for 20 years, which is hard to believe. And uh, so, yeah. That's a pretty extraordinary thing because uh, a lot of people thought I would never get married. So, uh, in fact, one of my friends said that one of the greatest proofs of the existence of God was that Laura married me. So he called it the Danological argument for the existence of God. Um, but I, that's where we live now. I have two kids, and I love being a dad, and um, I love getting to do this. I want to begin with a question this morning. I, I often begin messages with a question. And it's an important question that I want you to think deeply about. And this question is this. What is the first thing that you think about when you think about God? Now, I, I don't want you to answer this out loud, but I, I, I want you to think about your answer to this question. What is the first thing that you think about when you think about God? What is the first thing that comes to your mind? And that's an important thing. And, and probably what comes to your mind has been shaped by your faith journey. It's been shaped by the church that you're a part of or attend. It's probably been shaped by your family and the teaching and the things that you've sat under. It's probably been impacted by experiences that you've gone through and your own spiritual journey. This morning, as we begin this journey of, of, of thinking about this incredible Hebrew word, hesed, right? This, this word that is almost undefinable. And yet a word that is so important and so extraordinary to actually understand who God is and his heart and his purpose for not only the world, but for your life. We're going to be in, in ex, the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bible, we're going to begin in Exodus 33 briefly and then, and then narrow in on Exodus 34. So Exodus chapter 33 and 34. And we're going to be encountering a man named Moses. Now I know almost all of you, probably without exception, are familiar with Moses and probably familiar with his story. Right? We know that, that Moses was born in Egypt and he was born at a time where Pharaoh was wanting to limit the population of the Hebrews and so he was under threat of being taken and murdered but his mom devised a plan and she put him in a basket and he was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter, raised in Pharaoh's house. But when he was 40 years old, he did something rashly, something that was uh, an act of passion, wanting to defend his, his, his brotherhood, the Hebrew people, and he murdered an Egyptian. And he had to flee, and he was a fugitive for 40 years. And in many ways, I believe Moses thought that that was now his lot in life. He had become a keeper of sheep, living 
in a place far from anywhere that he knew. And that was his life until one day God met him at the, in the desert through the burning bush, calls him to an incredible and extraordinary task to be the one that will lead his people out of, out of Egypt, out of slavery, through the Red Sea, and to the Promised Land. And so Moses is chosen for this incredible, incredible privilege. And not only is he chosen that, but God chooses to reveal himself to Moses in ways that he's never revealed himself to any other man. And Moses, as we come to Exodus 33, is a man who has experienced God closely. He's a man who has experienced his power and his glory. But he is a man who's about to come to a place of understanding who God is in an extraordinary way. But it happens uh, out of a very painful situation. As we come to Exodus 33, the, the context is they have come out of Egypt. They've come to Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up on the mountain. He's met with God. And God has established a covenant with his people. And he's teaching them how to be. They, they have been a nation of slaves for 400 years. And now he is teaching them how they are going to be his unique people. And he, because he has a unique purpose for them. And Moses goes up on the mountain and he receives the Ten Commandments inscribed by the very finger of God on tablets of stone. But while he's up there, for 40 days he's up on the mountain and the people of God begin to get restless, right? And they start to wonder, what happened to Moses? Where is Moses? Is he ever coming back? And as they become restless, they become idolatrous. And they decide that they need to make a God to worship. They need to make an idol to worship. And so... They, they go to Aaron, Moses' brother, and, and, and they accumulate uh, all their gold, and they bring this together, and Aaron forms this golden calf, and they begin to worship, and he says, Israel, here is your gods. All this happening in spite of what God had done for them already. And God warns Moses. He says, Moses, you need to get off this mountain because the people have made an idol, and, and, and Moses goes down. And he sees what's happening. He hears what's happening. He becomes so angry himself that he, he takes the Ten Commandments and he s throws them down and they shatter. It's a dark time in Moses' life. It's a dark time in the, in, the, in the Israelites' life, although they don't fully understand it. And God says something very painful to Moses in Exodus 33. Exodus 33, he says, in, he says this, he says, but I will not go up with you because you are a stiff-necked people. Otherwise, I might destroy you on the way. And so right before that, God has told the, the, the people, he says, you can go to the promised land, but my presence, I, I will not be with you. And for Moses, this is an extraordinary painful moment. It says, when the people heard this bad news, they mourned and they didn't put on their jewelry. For the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I went up with you for a single moment, I would destroy you. So now take off your jewelry and I will decide what to do with you. And so this is a, this is a pivotal moment where the people rightly deserve God's judgment, right? They rightly deserve his wrath. And Moses is now going to intercede for the people. He's going to go to God on their behalf. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. Moses was not happy with the people. right? He ground down that golden calf into powder and put it in their water and made them drink it. right? There was, there was people who were executed for their idolatry. There was a plague that God sent and many died. And so the, the consequences and the seriousness of sin was on full display. But Moses goes before God and he asks God to be merciful to them. He asks God to go with them. Moses can't bear the thought of going on without God. And so he, he pleads with God for this. And God offers him a promise. He says, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses says, if your presence does not go, don't make us go up from here. How will it be known that I and your people have found favor with you unless you go with us? I and your people will be distinguished from all the other people in the face of the earth. And the Lord answered Moses and said, I will do this very thing you have asked, for you have found favor with me, and I know you by name. And then Moses is going to say something extraordinary. As God responds to Moses in his mercy and in his grace and says, Moses, I will go with you. You have 
You have asked. You have pleaded. And I will go with you. And then Moses blurts something out. He said, please, let me see your glory. Now Moses has seen God in the burning bush, if you will. He didn't see him, but he was, his presence was there. He's seen his power. He's seen the Red Sea split. He has seen the plagues in Egypt. He has seen the pillar of fire by night and the pillar of cloud by day. He has met with God in the tent of meeting. He is, knows what it's like to encounter the presence of God. But he is desperate for a deeper encounter with God. He knows that if he is going to continue to lead these people, if God's going to be with them, he needs a deeper encounter with God. And the thing that I have been praying for us here at Chehi Week 1 is that we would be a people who would also pray this prayer. And I've been praying this prayer that, God, would you show us your glory? Would you allow us to see you for who you are in a deeper way, in a richer way, in a fuller way? And God will answer Moses' prayer in an extraordinary way. He will invite him one more time to go up on the mountain. He gives him very clear and careful instructions that he is to come up alone. And God says, I will allow my goodness, which is his glory, to pass by you. You won't be able to see my face. You won't be able to see my presence. But I will pass by you and I will shelter you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand, and I will allow my glory to pass by, and after I've passed by, I will allow you to see what's there. And so Moses goes up on the mountain, and in Exodus 34, and and if you look with me there, uh, beginning in verse 4, it says, The Lord came down in a cloud, and He stood with him there, and He proclaimed His name, the Lord, right, The, the, the personal name of God. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, which the Hebrew word that we pronounce Yahweh, right, which is the four Hebrew consonants that, that, that make up the, the personal name of God and then the vowels from Lord, from Adonai. Right? We don't know for sure how it's pronounced. Jewish people would not even say it out loud. And so this is the personal name of God, the name that, that God had revealed by himself to Moses at the burning bush, the, the name that, that declares that God is not just a being, but that he is being itself. Right? He is the self-existing one. And so he reveals himself twice. He declares his name. It's the only place in Scripture that God says his name twice. And he says, the Lord, the Lord. And then, he, then he's going to describe himself to Moses. And it's an extraordinary description. And it might not be exactly what we would have thought that he would choose to begin with. But notice what he says. The Lord is compassionate. He is gracious a gracious God, slow to anger, and abounding in faithful love. There's our word, hesed. He's abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining hesed, faithful love, to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Moses immediately knelt low on the ground and worshiped. And he said, my Lord... If indeed I have found favor with you, my Lord, please, please go with us. Even though this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our iniquity and our sin and accept us as your own possession. God allows Moses, based on Moses' request, right? Moses requests, God, show me your glory. And God allows him and he brings him up and he reveals himself to him by his name twice. And then he begins to share who he is. And so I want you to wrestle with this question. What is the first thing that you think about when you think about God? Because here, God is going to reveal what he is like to Moses. But not only to Moses, but to you and to me and to anyone who would come to him. He says that he is compassionate. The first thing that God chooses to say about himself is that he is a God of compassion. It's a word that means tender mercy. It's a word that, that can be described even as pity. It's, very linked, it's linked very closely with the Hebrew word for womb, for the womb in a, in a body. And so it, it, is, it is a word that connotes a helpless baby being nurtured by their mother. Psalm 103 verse 13 says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. Isn't it an extraordinary thing that God reveals Himself as a God who has compassion? He's the all-powerful Creator. right? He spoke 
the universe into existence. The, the universe that's so vast that we can't even begin to measure it or understand it. He sustains all of it by His power. He is, his power is, is so far beyond our comprehension. And yet this God describes Himself as He relates to humanity as compassionate. That there's a tenderness to God's character. He has not yet revealed Himself in Scripture as a father. But the first word he uses to describe himself is a parental word. And it's one of the words that hesed, as we'll come to in just a moment, draws to itself. Remember we said this, this word is so hard to define. It takes more than one word to understand it. And this word compassion is a word that we see used often with hesed. The next word is gracious. He says, not only am I compassionate, but I'm gracious. And it's the act of God granting his blessing when it's undeserved, despite human frailty, despite human foolishness, God is gracious. The people do not deserve His grace. You don't deserve God's grace. I don't deserve God's grace. Right? Grace is receiving something that you do not deserve, but that is good, that is a blessing. And despite Israel's blatant sin, God is choosing to be gracious to them. Despite your sin and my sin, God offers His grace to us. He's compassionate. He's gracious. He's slow to anger. Aren't you grateful for that? Anybody here this morning grateful that God is slow to anger? Oh man, aren't you glad that that God doesn't bring instant justice for your sin? That God is compassionate. He's gracious, but he's patient, incredibly patient. He is slow to anger. And God has demonstrated this throughout, throughout history. From creation till now, God has demonstrated his patience with mankind. Think about how he interacted with Adam and Eve in the garden, right? God gave them one rule. You know, one of the reasons that I resisted coming to Chehi, right, because as I heard about all the rules, right, and I thought, man, that's just too many rules for me. Anybody else? Right? A couple of you. Counselors are writing down names, so keep that hand up. I, I thought, there's too many rules. I, I, you know, it's, it's too restrictive. Well, God gave Adam and Eve one rule, Right? One rule. He created this perfect place for them to live. And he says, all, the only rule I have is do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For if you do, you will surely, help me out, die. One rule. But they couldn't keep the one rule. But God didn't just come down and wipe them out. Right? He came down and he asked them questions. Adam, where are you? We're hiding in the bushes. Adam was the worst hide and seek player ever. Are you with me? Right? I mean, the moment God said something, he's like, I'm over here in the bushes. And God was compassionate with them. His judgment was certain. Right? God's compassion does not negate the fact that he is just. But he clothed them, he cared for them, and he gave them opportunity. He's slow to anger. You know, sometimes there's this perception that God, especially if we think, is the God in the Old Testament the same as the God in the New Testament? Is the God in the Old Testament just angry and moody all the time? no. God does possess anger. He has the capacity for anger. He's even given you the capacity for anger. How many of you have ever used your capacity? (laughs) All right. And there is a time, there is a place to be angry. Many times it leads us to sin, but not always. But God never sins. His anger is righteous. But it's not the defining characteristic of who He is. He's slow to anger. And then we come to our word, abounding, abounding, in the steadfast love, has said, And there it is in the Hebrew tied with one of the words it's most associated with, truth. This is God's loyal covenant love. How do we define has said? Uh, there, there's no perfect way to do it. There, there's a book that I've read uh, by a man named Michael Card, who's a musician uh, and uh, a, a deep thinker. And he's written a whole book on the subject of has said. And I, I got that book and I just, I just, one of those books that I just devoured because it just, drew me in. And in that book, he offers a a suggested definition. And it's something like this. I'll I'll paraphrase it. But it's when the person from whom you deserve the least or deserve nothing chooses to give you everything. When the person from whom you deserve nothing chooses to give you everything. And I I think in many ways it, 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 it begins to help us understand this covenant, faithful, loyal love of God, His mercy, His faithfulness. There's so many things that are woven into this word. 
Another definition that was offered by a five-year-old when they were presented with this was, it's God buttering the bread on both sides. It's that over-the-top, abundant mercy, faithfulness, love. And it says that God says of himself that he abounds in hesed. And his love is not based, his faithfulness, his hesed is not based on human faithfulness. His, his hesed is not based on human goodness. His hesed is not based on us earning it or deserving it, but it's based on who he is, his character. And it says, the next thing it says that he maintains this loyal love, this faithful covenant love to a thousand generations. Right, that that this, this is something that God not only abounds in, but that he maintains and he offers to us. Then God describes himself as forgiving. Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. To forgive, this word means to carry or to lift. It's a reminder that any time there's forgiveness, the one who does the forgiving has to bear the burden of the issue that needed forgiveness. Right? In order to forgive someone, you're saying, I am taking the burden off of you. Maybe, some, maybe there's been some point in your life where you said something or did something you regretted. Maybe. Maybe. Anybody? And just maybe you asked for forgiveness. Right? I am sorry that I said that to you. I didn't mean it. I'm sorry I did that. I wasn't aware of how it affected you. Would you forgive me? And if the person chooses to forgive you, they're saying, I'm going to unburden you from that burden, right? I forgive you. Take that burden off. I'll bear it. And God bears the consequence of sin because forgiveness is never free. But notice these three words that cover the whole picture of our, our sinfulness. Iniquity, transgression, and sin. Iniquity means guilt. It, it means that, that, that there are people that are guilty, right? And all, the Bible says, all have sinned. Right? So we're all guilty. But then the, word re- the, the next word is the transgression. It means rebellion. Right? It means to rebel. It means to break away, to go away, to intentionally rebel against a commandment or against God. And then sin, it means to miss the mark, to fall short, to miss the standard. And so using all three words, it's a very thorough description that God gives of how his forgiveness is also thorough. That it forgives our guilt. That it forgives our rebellion. That it forgives our missing the mark. But then notice that God also describes himself as just. Right? God describes himself as a people, right? To the people, and he says, or to Moses. And he says, I do all these things, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. His has said, his mercy, his faithfulness, his covenant love, it is... Not at, the, not, at the, not at the point of saying, well, sin just doesn't matter. God's, God's merciful, he's gracious, he's forgiving. It does matter, and God does hold the guilty accountable. And in fact, here, he reminds them that sin also has consequences to others. Right? He's not saying, and the Bible's very clear, that we are all accountable for our individual sin. And so when talking about punishing and the second and third generation, he's not, he's not saying that it's their guilt is passed on, but he's saying they will bear the consequences, and, and this will be lived out among the people, right? You know the story, right? Just a little while after this, that they will refuse to go into the promised land, they'll refuse to trust God, and the children and the grandchildren will bear 40 years in the wilderness because of their parents' sin. But God is just. He does punish sin. In fact, his compassion and his grace and his patience and his loyal love, his faithfulness, his covenant love, none of that would actually make sense if God was not also just. And so Moses has gone up on the mountain at a painful time. He has heard the most painful words. I'm not going to go with you. And all of you know, I'm sure all of you know what it's like to hear something painful. Right? To hear painful words. And why would God speak painful words to Moses? Why would God allow him to feel that pain? Because God uses pain. And he uses things. He, God used that pain to lead Moses to a deeper place of seeking him, to a deeper place of knowing him. God never, ever wastes your pain. He never wastes your suffering. Now Moses has had a deeper encounter than he's ever had before. And Moses is overcome with who God is. At the burning bush, God asked him to take his sandals off because he was on holy ground. 
Moses has worshipped God before, but now notice in the text that Moses falls down in worship. Right? When he is made aware of the glory of God, as, as he's in the presence of God, as he's in this place and he hears about who God is, he falls down in worship. He's overcome. And it's my prayer for you and for me that we will also be overcome with who God is. And that we will know him for who he is. And Moses, as he worships God, then begins to say, God, if, 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 if you really are who you are, and you really are who you claim to be, then please go with us. Right? Moses is still lingering with that doubt. Maybe God won't go. He knows. what, And he says, even though the people are stiff-necked, and now Moses knows that he can ask God for what they do not deserve. God has revealed himself as one who does not treat them the way they deserve. And so now Moses asks for what he does not deserve, what the people do not deserve. And this is a prayer in response to God's said. Would you go with us? Moses asks for this because he knows that he can. He comes down off of the mountain, glowing, having been in the presence of God. Changed. He's different. And God will now go with his people. It will be a crazy journey. There'll be complaining. There'll be sin. There'll be judgment. There'll be 40 years of wandering. But God will go with his people. You know, we often kind of go back and forth between extremes when dealing with God. Right? Is, is God just compassionate and kind and permissive? He's like that parent that you can get away with anything with, or that teacher, right? And, and God just says, it's okay. Or your view of God might shift more to the side of God is angry. And God is always looking to see if I'm going to mess up. He's looking to see what I did. He's impossible to please. And what I want you to see this morning is God for who he is. And how we relate to him. And obviously, we read this text knowing that we relate to God through Jesus. right? Who is God himself come in human flesh who lived a sinless life on your behalf, who died in your place, who rose from the dead, and makes it possible for you to know God in the very same way that Moses knew him. And so my prayer for you this week is that you will have a deeper and richer account with God and with who he is. And I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. I want to invite you to say, God, would you show me your glory? Would you reveal yourself to me? And wherever you are in your walk with God, some of you, you know God, you're saved, you love God, you're seeking Him, you want to live for Him. And I want you to pray, God, show me your glory so that I can go to a deeper place of knowing. Some of you love God, you're saved, but you're not really living for God. That's where I was when I came to know God. I want to ask you to pray this prayer. God, show me your glory so that my life might be changed. Some of you are saved, you know God, but you've wandered into the weeds of sin. And you're not, you're not walking where you should walk. I want you to pray this prayer. God, show me your glory. Some of you might be skeptical. You might have doubts or questions. You're not even sure if you have faith. Or you don't want to have faith. I want to ask you to pray this prayer. God, show me your glory. Whoever you are, whatever you are, would you show me your glory? Let's pray that prayer together. Because the first thing that you think about God is so important. He's compassionate. I want you to see his compassion for you today. I want you to see his grace that he offers you. I want you to marvel at his patience with you. I want you to discover just a tiny, tiny taste of his descent. Just a taste of this loyal love, the one who owes you nothing but delights to give you everything. I want you to know that he maintains that loyal love, that he keeps you, and you can rest in his love. I want you to know that he's forgiving and that you can be free. Right? I want you to know that he forgives our rebellion. Right? He forgives our iniquity. He forgives our shame and our sin. And there are two key responses. Worship and witness. Worship and witness. The first thing that Moses did, having experienced God's presence, was to worship him. And when you experience God for who he is, no one will have to tell you to worship him. You were made to worship it. And our hearts should resonate when we experience God, God's incredible love, who he is. Our hearts resonate in worship. 